as we build a clean energy future, solar energy research is diversifying. This is one of the focuses of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Excellence Science, a collaboration between Australian unis and industry that explores how light interacts with advanced materials. In particular, they study excitants, an excited state of matter that is crucial to semiconductors, which are used in light-based applications from lasers to solar cells. One group within the ARC is working on building better solar panels. Right now, typical silicon solar cells only capture about 30% of the energy that lands on them. So part of this group's research is trying to identify cheaper and more efficient materials to make these cells. That's where researchers like Carl Bell come in. He is trying to find new candidate materials for these cells using an interesting approach, machine learning. I spoke to Carl last week about his research. Carl, you've just developed a machine learning program um, that does the job of a supercomputer on a normal PC or laptop. Could you tell me how you created it? Every time a simulation is run on a supercomputer, it produces a bunch of output files uh, containing information about that simulation. And sometimes the information in these files is converted into a database and shared online. Um, we've written software that aggregates all this information uh, produced by millions of simulations into uh, our own database. Now, we then took this database and fed it into a machine learning algorithm which was an artificial neural network and asked the algorithm to figure out the important relationships between the chemical composition and other properties that we were interested in. And after tuning the algorithm a little bit, we were able to save it and hook it up to web API so everyone else can use it. So what did you actually, what did you actually use the program for? Yep. Simulations can be uh, extraordinarily computationally expensive um, and the process requires specialised hardware and can be quite time consuming to configure. And so this means you need to be really careful with uh, what you simulate, the, the choices of uh, simulation. And this starts to limit the freedom to experiment, which uh, often is needed uh, to learn more or you know, for those happy discoveries. Uh, we needed to find a way to reduce this time so we could exhaustively screen all sorts of materials quickly. So the, with that in mind, the program was initially developed to predict the, the band gap of a material. Um, the width or size of a band gap defines how material will act. So if a band gap is too large, then the material will be uh, an insulator. Um, and if there's no band gap, then it's a conductor. Uh, but there's another category where electrons can be encouraged to make their way across the band gap. And these materials are classified as semiconductors. And this is the class of materials that we're, we're really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, semiconductors are useful for a wide range of applications uh, from computer chips to solar panels. And predicting the size of a band gap will tell you how useful a material will be as a semiconductor and um, how also about how it may be used when manufactured. Mm -hmm. So finding these materials with a specific band gap, uh, but different chemical composition might allow you to do um, certain things like perhaps create a solar panel out of a new different material that is much uh, cheaper to source and easier to fabricate. Mm -hmm. And how did this new program allow you to improve on the time and cost of making the calculations? Well, typically uh, running simulations is a very time consuming process. Um, you first need to figure out what simulation you want to run. Um, and then you need to prepare the software for that simulation. And then you need to find the hardware that can run that software efficiently. So that generally means using a supercomputer. And finally, um, you need to manage the process of uh, getting the hardware to run the software, um, which is not always uh, an easy thing to do. Uh, this has involved using more software, of course, um, job scheduling and similar. And um, this part of the process can be quite flaky. Uh, so what, what you'd find is that uh, your average garden variety physicist would prepare a bunch of simulations or prepare a bunch of files for a simulation and then pop it onto the queue and then say, right, time to go and get a sandwich or something else for lunch and then um, head off and have lunch, come back and hope that the, uh, the computer had picked up that uh, item off the queue and processed it correctly. And often we find that um, the queue management part really lets down the simulation. So if the simulation actually makes it onto the supercomputer in the first place, it then takes can take quite a while to run. So with the software we've produced, we've, we've really removed basically all that stuff. You don't need to have the supercomputer and you don't need to have the queue management or any of that kind of stuff. So we've removed the dependency and all that. 
And um, so the computation time has also been brought down to, you know, milliseconds as opposed to um, hours or days or even weeks. Mm. Sounds really cool. It sounds like it's going to open up like a lot of pretty cool opportunities. Um, but is this program only applicable to specific applications or could it be used for other things as well? Well, currently um, we focused on the area that we were really interested in. So that was uh, semiconductors with band gap, um, a band gap prediction. But we, we made the decision to um, call our or label our software or brand our software, if you like, as a platform because we've, we've built all the workflows uh, to create new models efficiently. Um, so currently the software can be used to make uh, very accurate predi uh, predictions on just a handful of different properties. So we're hoping that the wider scientific community and, and you know, maybe even industry will collaborate with us to enrich the platform so we can gather a, a wider audience and potentially grow the platform again. Um, theoretically, if you have a chemical composition as an input and you'd like to know something about that as your output, something that you'd like to predict, then we can, we can theoretically, we could, we could build that assuming we have the data. So is this platform going to be available for other scientists to use as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, anyone can go to our uh, website right now and use um, any of the, we've got five models up there that are available. Um, there's a web UI, you just whack some numbers in and um, you'll get a you'll get a value out the other side. Uh, we've also built uh, to industry standards, current industry standards, an API, web API that you can hook up to uh, if you register at the website. Um, registration is free. And uh, all we ask is that you follow the citing and attribution um, guidelines published on the website, but there's, there's nothing onerous in there. We won't come and take your firstborn or anything like that. Um, so the, the main thing is we're, we're really keen to collaborate. And so we've tried to, we've tried to uh, kind of grease the wheels there by creating this website and the API. So come along and use it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what's next for this particular line of research? Uh, the next thing uh, for this particular line of research is um, probably uh, calculating or predicting effective mass. We've uh, done a bunch of uh, calculating um, or calculations for effective mass. And so we can, we can uh, calculate effective mass now for a range of compounds using parabolic dispersion. I think we've got a, a probably 25 to 30,000 calculations in our data set now, which is uh, pretty large and certainly the largest data set that I'm currently aware of. Uh, so it would be really great to build another machine learning model that can predict that. It can be a bit tricky to obtain effective mass uh, calculations. So I'd be really, I think that would be a really nice one um, to work on next. Great. Well, best of luck with that, Carl. And thank you so much for having a chat with us today. Uh, thank you very much for having me.